Ladies and gentlemen, and fairy creatures of all kinds, welcome back to In the Eyes of Truth English Edition. Today with us we have Regis uh, Tremblay. Uh, he's back, the one and only, uh, and uh, he's been working on some projects uh, down in that far fair land called Crimea that only occasionally gets uh, unwelcome visitors from the Nazis up north. Welcome back, Regis. Top of the morning, mates. And on this ends my poor British accent, but does not end my message to you. Are you less than thrilled to learn that asylum seekers in the UK have quadrupled in a year? Are you tired of certain favored demographics benefiting from a two-tier policing system? Are you tired of foreigners being in the top tier of the two-tier legal social system you live under? Are you tired of the government stripping you of the right to go into entire neighborhoods and sectors of your cities without fear of crime and harassment? Are you tired of the fact that your women folk are afraid to go out in the evening? Are you tired of your children being bullied in school and you being able to do next to nothing about it? Are you tired of the grooming gangs? Are you tired of being taxed to death? Are you tired of net zero and Agenda 2030 destroying your farming and village life? Are you shocked and scared of what was happening across the channel to the farmers in the Netherlands, knowing the same thing is coming for you? Are you tired of having your Christian faith and English culture under attack by the government, the left, and their foreign pets? Are you angered knowing that you live worse than your parents and your children will face even more pressure and poverty? Have I got a deal for you? How would you like to trade in your overregulated crown owned 300 hectares farms for a 3,000 hectare farm that you will own and pass on into perpetuity to your children and grandchildren? How would you like grants, low interest loans, free assistance to get you started farming this new land? How would you like low taxes, minimal government interference as you farm to your heart's content in some of the richest black earth on the planet? How would you like to live in a Christian land where Christmas and Easter are still the main holidays, where government leaders do not hide their faith and go to church? How would you like to live in a land where large families are celebrated, given assistance by the government? How would you like to live in a, like a, in a land where Christian values are celebrated, and upheld, and the people friendly and helpful. Where schools teach children the fundamentals of mathematics and science. Where more engineers are graduated every year than any other nation on earth. Where a home or church schooling is also an option. Where factories are opening up each and every year month, and jobs are abundant for those with technical skills. How would you like to live in Europe's number one economy? growing faster than any Western nation. Well, to your shock, or maybe not, this nation is called Russia, the fourth largest economy in the world, an agricultural superpower that still has tens of millions of hectares of land in need of farming. And just to make things sweeter, President Vladimir Putin has recently signed a decree that will give traditional Christian families from the UK and the rest of the illiberal Western countries, refugee status in Russia. You no longer have to know the Russian language or be related to Russians to be able to get a temporary residency visa that can be turned into a permanent, tempor uh, tempor a permanent residency visa that can then be turned into citizenship. By God, it's as if Providence itself has given you the keys to the land of milk and honey. Are you ready to seize the opportunity? Is your faith strong enough to take the hand that Providence has extended and save your children from Sodom and Gomorrah? True, the task may be daunting, but it's not. And we at Exit Strategy are ready to help. We're here to answer the questions, create the action plan, guide you onto those gentle shores. We have the resources. We have the people. We have the strength to bring you from the seas of storm sin and oppression to these quiet, peaceful shores. Reach out and contact us. The details are in the video's description. Russia's not Zion, but it's the closest thing there is on this mortal coil, and we're here to guide you to it. Exit Strategy World, your partner.
Exit Strategy World. Thanks, uh, it's good to be with you. Hey, uh, let me ask you a question. Um, on the U.S. elections, uh, with the, the, did you see the Harris uh, interview with uh, Fox News? Uh, I saw a clip that somebody sent me, but uh, if you want to ask me a question about what I think about the election, first of all, I'll be happy to answer that. Go ahead. Well, you know, I've been living in Question Crimea. Implied. <laughs> yeah, I've been living in Crimea now for five years. Um, and the reason, and there there are several, but um, maybe the one of the most important reasons is because I could no longer live in the United States, uh, the country of my birth, which I no longer recognized and would never acknowledge that the government that's been in place, at least since Kennedy, is not my government. The last time I voted was for the first Obama campaign. And it only took me a very short while to realize I made a serious mistake. I think that Obama was a chameleon uh, he was a Trojan horse, and I felt, on the one hand, betrayed, but that election was a wake-up call for me when I realized that it didn't matter who was in the White House, the orders and commands and control resisted somewhere else. So I am not paying a lot of attention, in fact, hardly any, to this particular election, especially in these last 20 days, I guess, up till the election, except when friends of mine send me emails <laughs> with <laughs> clips, mostly about Kamala Harris, or Camilla, or Caramella, or whatever she's going to call herself. Chameleon Harris. Camelia Harris. There you go. Yeah, chameleon. Chameleon. <laughs> like that. Chameleon. Yeah. So I, I will say this. I'm embarrassed at the two candidates that is all that the United States can come up with that are running for the highest office in the land and probably one of the most powerful people in the world. Now, I will say this. I do not believe that these people got there through any democratic process. They were selected as the candidates have maybe always been selected for that office. And I will repeat, I'm embarrassed as an American when my Russian friends ask me about the election and who do I think will win? And they always say they think Trump is going to win. Why? Because he's the only one saying that he is going to end the war in Ukraine. But they they don't really believe that's possible. And I will end with this, Stas, and you know this. Um, President Putin, Sergei Lavrov, Maria Saharova, and others have been repeating now for weeks, if not months, that it is not the president of the United States who determines foreign policy. And they know and have said they believe nothing will change regardless of who's elected. That's Those are my thoughts on the United States election coming up here November 4th. You know, yeah, it's uh, out of 320 million people, and that's the best you get. By the way, uh, I don't know if I ever told you, I'm, I might have mentioned, uh, I'm a monarchist. And this is one of the reasons I'm a monarchist. 
But the people that are still clueless enough to say, oh, but republicanism or democracy works because only the best rise up. Right. <laughs> only the best rise up. I mean, it's it's not this election. Just go back to see how many elections. I, I'd say Reagan was probably the last one that was all right. But since Reagan, no, no, nobody's been all right. They're all um, a part of the machine at best. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it goes back way further than that. Oh, I yeah, think. yeah. I, I question whether... Uh, there was ever a popular candidate, uh, and, and I think that it, it's always been determined by uh, big money, oh, course, the industrialist, and and I, I will go all the way back to uh, the city of London. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, post World War, uh, post World War Two, I would probably say the. Four best presidents the U.S. had was Lyndon Johnson. I'm sorry, not Lyndon Johnson. Was um, Eisenhower? Was um, Nixon, uh, Kennedy, and Reagan? Two of those guys weren't really supposed to be presidents, and those uh, Kennedy and Reagan, um, and Nixon because Nixon actually believed in real politics. Which is why he was taken out the way he was taken out. I mean, the 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 the, the whole affair that took him out is is so kindergarten compared to the crap that the candidates do now. The party, right. it's like it's, it's it's how quaint. Oh, really? That's it. That's all they did, and that's all it took. How quaint! Yeah. Wow, mm -hmm. really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the issue I had with Eisenhower and. I was alive then, and I remember that election. And I remember these little buttons that we they gave out people, I love Ike. And the issue I have with Eisenhower is in his farewell address, after eight years, he warned the country about the military industrial complex. And yet, if there was a person alive, it was this honored, sanctified general of World War II who had the power to restore the United States to a peacetime economy. He didn't do it. Now the question is, did he really have the power? Ah, now we got Or it. was he really under control of these people behind the curtain? Well, you know, he... he help create the uh, CIA as an official entity. And then you want to get rid of them. But uh, yeah, w once you uh, you make something like that, it's pretty hard to shove them back into a box, a exactly. bag, or, or, you know, kick them out. Uh, it's... Yeah, and I think I think it uh, it goes back to the, uh, the concepts of American exceptionalism, uh, American being the city on the hill, the model for democracy and human rights and freedom around the world. And uh, I think it was the continuation of uh, British European imperialism, which I believe has been in the DNA of the United States of America since the white European colonialists arrived on our shores. Uh, you just look at the history of our country, of my country and your adopted country really, uh, has been one of the displacement of indigenous peoples and the stealing of resources and land. Oh, yeah. They moved from the East Coast when they had conquered all of that, taken most of the West Coast from Mexico, from the Spanish. Then they moved West across the Pacific and they've really never stopped. Yep. After, yep. after World War II, basically, in my view, the United States uh colonized all of Europe, Western Europe. And over the years, with the fall of the Soviet Union, the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, the imperialist UK and the United States moved in and rounded up many of those former Soviet republics. 
yeah, yeah. So, so I believe, I believe, Stash, this has been an imperialist uh, journey dating back to the European imperial colonizers of many centuries ago. Well, you know, the, first of all, you've got uh, Manifest Destiny, uh, and then you've got the worst thing that ever happened in Latin America. It's called the Monroe Doctrine. Yeah, and the U.S. has been the biggest uh, break on the development of Latin America. Physically, the biggest break uh, has destroyed uh, God only knows how many uh, regimes and oh, con uh, how many governments split countries apart for its own use, uh, such as Panama uh, split from Colombia when Panama didn't want the uh, the American deal on the Panama Canal. They wanted they didn't want it for cheap that the Americans wanted. You know, and, and so on. But and if you look at the very revolution or the the war of separation, where it really was, uh, it came about after uh, the king signed a had his envoy sign deals with the various Indian nations that not a not a step further, and the local elites really didn't like that. So yeah, you're right. Well, you know, in my case, uh, I grew up a patriotic American. God bless America, Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, you know, very religious person growing up in a religious community, very conservative. And really, I I spent most of my young adulthood uh, believing in America, freedom, democracy. Uh, we were the good guys. And then I had the opportunity to, to study in Rome. And I lived in Rome for four years, traveled extensively in Europe. Many of my classmates were Italian. Well, they were from all over the world, East and West. And for the first time in my life, I had people hold a mirror up in front of my face and say, you see this? This is what we see. You have murdered people in our countries, in Asia, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, Korea. Uh, many South American classmates <laughs> didn't have a lot of love for the United States of America. They hadn't romanticized, you know, the Hollywood version like the Europeans had. Right. And so right. for the first time in my life, my eyes were open. <clears throat> but. I just kind of, I didn't become radicalized at that point. I I began to wake up from a sleep, but it was like I was just waking up. And then it was a matter of being very involved, <clears throat> very busy for the next <clears throat> really 40, 50 years until 2011 when I went to Jeju Island in South Korea to ostensibly film a protest that had been going on for seven years at that time against the construction of a naval base for the United States pivot to Asia. But what I learned in the month there <clears throat> was what had been classified for more than 70 years. <clears throat> And that was prior to the Korean conflict in 1946 and 47, under the command of the United States military government of Korea, under General MacArthur, who implemented that, somewhere between 30 and 60,000 peasants on this island were slaughtered because they refused to accept the government of the United States of Korea. And they were ordered, massacred. It was a free fire zone. This had been top secret and classified in Korea, in South Korea, and in the United States until somewhere around 1999. But I found out about it and I made that film. And as a result of Sorry. going to South Korea, 
learning what my country had done, I was filled with anger and tears. I came home. I made two trips to the National Archives in, uh, in, in uh, where the hell is it now, Virginia. And I got more documentation, video, films. And it was that point that I became fully aware of the real history of my country, dating back to when the white European colonialists came to this country and committed a genocide on the Native American peoples, North America, South America, Canada. And I began studying now more and reading more uh, about the real history of the United States. And it was because of that that I had to come to Russia in 2016 to finish my second major film. It was called 30 Seconds to Midnight because I felt we were that close to a nuclear exchange between the United States and Russia. When the Bureau of Atomic Scientists had their doomsday clock at three and a half minutes to midnight, I said, no, no, we are much closer. In that case, so where are we right now? If I were to issue that film today, it would be the final countdown, three, two, one, holding. But I came to Russia to try to find out the truth about Russia and the Russian people. Because for my entire life, Russia has been demonized yeah. by the politicians in the country, by the media, by Hollywood, uh, in civic, uh, civic uh, ceremonies and observations. And I never really believed that because of the time I spent in Rome and in Europe and the travels I made through Asia to make my first film. And what I found was the exact opposite of what I had been told my entire adult life. And I finished that film, 30 Seconds to Midnight. And it was later in 2018 and 2019, I came and accompanied two citizen diplomacy delegations that traveled to many cities in Russia. And I traveled to, at that time, maybe five or six cities and villages documenting what these Americans were experiencing and what I was experiencing and seeing through the lenses of my cameras. I returned to the States. I published several of those, well, many of those videos that I made. And in 2019, I made up my mind that I couldn't live there anymore. And having been to Crimea on three previous trips, I knew that I could live there modestly, frugally, but comfortably on my social security and two really small pensions. Did I realize what was gonna to happen to me? I expected it. Stas, I have lost 30 to 40 long time childhood friends, friends through high school, college and beyond, I have lost friends, people who I thought were friends through my entire life that disowned me, ostracized me. I even lost family. I have a son, two sons and a daughter. The youngest one is in the United States Army. He's a Apache helicopter pilot. He told me to get out of his life and don't talk to me anymore. I have been permanently deleted 550 
videos going back 20 years when I was documenting environmental and anti-war and anti-nuclear protest in the United States and other parts of the country. 550 videos permanently deleted. No backup. Right now, right now, because I'm living here, I am being shadow banned. I have been locked out of Facebook two or three times. I'm back now after the last one, which was almost a year. And I am convinced that because I'm living here, somehow my previous shows, and I was doing two and three on StreamYard, I could no longer do because of interrupted internet, unstable internet. My internet here in Yalta is extremely fast. And so what I'm saying is because people take these stands and positions against the government and speak truth to power are honestly searching for truth, trying to remove the fog of lies and propaganda of a lifetime. I understand the position that I'm in. And unlike many of our colleagues who are now alt media, independent media in the United States, and I'm not even talking about Europe or Asia or anywhere else, but many of these people had, have suffered greatly because they stepped out. Yep. Yeah. They've lost they've lost income. They've lost reputations. If they've published books, uh, critical reviews of those books appeared in the New York Times for a couple of my friends. And so it's really an era of censorship and repression. And Stas, I once believed I lived in the freest country in the world, the most democratic country in the world. But as I look at my country now, over the last five years that I've been here, I can only say that the United States of America is a fascist country. Fascism, the union of government and politics with business. Big business, big business. Big business, the military industrial complex, the media, universities. Banking. Well, the universities are just an instrument of, of the government or the uh, the brainwashing facility. Well, well, exactly. And if people only understood why these universities for decades now have been funded to the tunes of billions and billions of dollars. In my own state in Maine, there are at least three or four military industrial complexes. But the University of Maine was granted several billion dollars to build a top secret research center that nobody knows about to this day. Nobody can because it's top secret. And there's hardly a college or university in the country that hasn't received money from either the Department of Defense or the State Department to conduct research on everything from security, internet security, domestic security, to military programs, including biological, which you and I both know have existed in Fort Detrick, Maryland, since after World War II. Um, and so, you know, the Spanish flu came from Fort Detrick. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know about World War II, but by World War One, the U.S. Yeah. was exporting uh, the Spanish flu. 
which for those who don't know, is called the Spanish flu only because it was the Spanish who first reported on it. Since everyone else who was suffering from it was fighting World War I, and nobody wanted to admit that their soldiers were dying off from some mysterious flu. And the Spanish said, hey, there's a mysterious flu, the Spanish flu. But it came from Fort Detrick, came with the Blow Boys to England, went from England to France, went from France to the Germans via POWs, went to Russia uh, from the Germans via POWs, uh, and so on and so on, and just spread across the world in three waves, by the way. Yeah. So it's not a pretty picture, uh, <laughs> yeah. what's happening in the United States. No. no. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's very disturbing to me. Uh, I worry about my children and my grandchildren. Oh, absolutely. It, it is it is the only concern that I really have is that I've not been able to see them in person, take part in their celebrations, their birthdays, their anniversaries, uh, except through a video chat like this. What about your, your other son and your daughter? Uh, they are still part of your life. Uh, yeah, yeah, go? yeah. Uh, my daughter and her oldest son, who's about 13 or 14 now, they feel that I've abandoned them. My daughter wants nothing to do with politics. I don't think she pays much attention to any of it, and I don't try to influence them at all. My oldest son, who's a 14-year Green Beret, Special Forces, uh, decorated, highly skilled, uh, not only a sharpshooter, a team trainer, but an intelligence officer. So he's very much part of it all. He got out on a 100% disability because he had two ruptured discs in his mm -hmm. spine. Yeah, pretty common. Uh, well, you know, from what they go through when they carry those 90 oh, pounds, yeah, yeah. jump out of planes and everything yeah, else. Pretty common, pretty but common. I'm happy to say we are very close. We talk almost every day, oh, that's uh, if not by video, but by uh, chat, you know, on one of the chat messenger things. And I'm happy to say that he has come around in terms of his political views. He is completely against the government, completely against the top brass in the military. He is, um, well, I would have to say this. I think he's more radical now than I am. You know, it's often those people that actually see that because they've been in different places and they've seen the actual... They, they they've uh, they've been there where the uh, the rubber meets the tarmac. Uh, realistically, your youngest son, uh, as a as a pilot, he has a very limited scope of what he actually sees. He has your oldest son, he, and he hasn't been deployed anywhere. Ah, he was sent. He sent. He's been in for like four, almost five years. I think he's going to get out because he doesn't want to stay there. But he he graduated very high in his class, and. They have made him a trainer, if you can believe that. Yeah, they yeah. Send, <laughs> they didn't send him into combat, so he's staying right in that echo chamber, you know? I, uh, You know, I was an instructor. Uh, my last year and a half, I was uh, uh, green green to gold uh, school. I was in the reserves my last year and a half. And I was in the uh, green to gold uh, program uh, at Fort Bragg, so the academy was at Fort Bragg, and I was one of the instructors. And... You know, I've been deployed all over the place. Uh, a couple of my buddies that went over with me to become instructors we were deployed all over the place. But the vast majority of the people there had not been anywhere. They finished off. They went through that uh, officer academy and they stayed there. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, realistically, guys, you, had no, you don't know anything. You've been sitting yeah. in this academy your entire uh and, and they were all reserves from the get-go. They were they had never been active duty. They'd never seen anything. And, and very opinionated as usual <laughs> for that type. <laughs> yeah. So here's here's something else. Uh, I'm wondering if you feel the way I do, that given the polarity, the divisiveness, the antagonism 
the anger that exists throughout the country now on not only politics and politicians, not only policy, but on just about everything else that you can imagine, whether it's LGBTQ+, whether it's transgenderism, uh, whether it's woke, uh, it doesn't matter. The country is so divided that I'm concerned that regardless of the outcome of this election, if it's razor sharp and it takes days or weeks to finally determine who the president is, we are likely to see violence. Oh, absolutely. And first of all, I absolutely believe if Trump lives through the elections, the Democrats will steal it anyway. They've stolen it once. They cannot not steal it again. Uh, and partially not just because they stole it, but because over the last four years, they've used the judicial system to push down anybody that was opposing them. And they damn well know, you know, that that's the death knell of any republic. I, I am absolutely anti-democracy. Democracy, by the way, uh, the founding fathers of America were anti-democracy. America is not a democracy. It's a representative republic. <laughs> democracy is mob rule. Somalia is democracy. Uh, if, if we're going to go down that road. Hell, I'm a monarch. I'm a constitutional monarch. So that's well, you know, I, you but, know what, what people you know, but what most Americans don't know is they wrote that constitution not for slaves, not for Native Americans, not for women, not for working people. Oh yeah, yeah. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of Jap of of happiness for us, us, yeah, our yeah. class. It's been a class fight the entire time. It's it, it's never been a democracy. I agree with you. Never. I'll give you a little something, too. Uh, Americans are very clueless about their history. Um, I had a teacher in about 10th grade, and she taught U.S. history like the Bible, like, you know, like a preacher of their. Uh, and, and she taught the good and the bad. Uh, and there were a lot of bad. And then I started studying on my own. Um, you, you know, there was a, a whole genre of songs that were banned uh, at, right after the U.S. Constitution was put in place that uh, were about that life under the king was better than under the republic. You know, are, are you familiar with the Whiskey Rebellion? Yeah. Okay, so what was the only tax that was... you And this is the only tax that the U.S. colonists paid... And that was used as the big rebellion for uh, against the king. That was the what tax? The tea tax. 10% tea tax. on tea. Oh, that's yeah. it. And that funded the military that was uh, defending uh, the perimeter, right? Keeping the peace. Well, you know, after Washington comes to power, or, or the modern uh, American Constitution, they started leveling taxes on a whole lot more than just tea. And one of those things they leveled taxes on was whiskey. But you got all these farmers living on the edge that, you know, the, the roads are non-existent. They can't get their crops into market because they spoil. So they make whiskey because whiskey doesn't spoil, right? <laughs> they can sell the whiskey and they can keep themselves afloat. And then Washington levels a, uh, a tax on whiskey. So you get the whiskey rebellion. Uh, and George Washington, by the way, uh, he didn't mince any words and he didn't pull any punches. He called... As small as the Continental Army or the, the American Army was at that point, he called them out and he crushed it. There, were, there weren't a lot of people killed, but there were people killed, and that wasn't the only one. And you start reading into it, it's like Jesus Christ. I mean, just give you one quick example. I, I don't want to take, take up uh, me being the uh, the one taking up the, the screen, but one quick example: um, the banks in Virginia. So you got these soldiers called to the militia, right? They're farmers. They've got credit that they took from the banks to buy their farms and run their farms. Uh, well, these uh, 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 in, uh, royal banks are now all American banks. Oh, and thanks for serving in the Continental Army or militia, but you weren't paying your credits off, and we've confiscated your farm and your family's out on the street. Thanks for uh, your service. Now go die off somewhere. And there was rebellions after that because, you know, what the hell did you fight for? You fought, you know, you had a you had a farm, you had whatever under the king, and now you've got nothing except a couple of years of service, and they've kicked you out on the street. 
<laughs> so the banks have been an issue in America from day one, uh, to, to put yeah. it mildly. Yeah. And people don't know this. This doesn't get this doesn't get taught. Well, you know, you're right. Uh, my undergraduate degree was United States history. And I got to tell you, uh, we learned nothing negative, nothing, nothing. We, we learned a bunch of dates, a bunch of American victories, the American wars, you know, the formation of the government, blah, 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 blah. Uh, that was it. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you one more real quick. War of 1812, which started war, which actually started in 1811, uh, was the whole reason. Oh, yeah, the, the, that, that, uh, uh, of sailors who were being forced to serve in the Royal Navy. That was, that was true. They were being forced to serve in the French Navy, too, uh, which is, by the way, fighting the undeclared war with America because America backed out of uh, paying back its loans. Since in the Revolutionary War, the entire American fleet was French. All the powder was French. All the cannons were French. All the uniforms were French. Half the soldiers were French. But we'll ignore all that. Um, uh, Benjamin Franklin did a lot of, uh, of uh, diplomatic work in getting the loans, but the U.S. backstabbed the French, uh, didn't give them uh, exclusive trade rights, went uh, after Yorktown surrendered, went to the British and uh, and uh, finished those agreements with the British. But that's all aside. So when the U.S. tried to annex Canada, they they took uh, Niagara Village and they were moving on Toronto. The, uh, the loyalists had been pushed out of the U.S. Uh, proper were backing up the uh, the Canadian militia. They stopped the uh, American advance. And then during the winter, which never normally happened, the British uh, tipped over two uh, divisions of uh, guard infantry, and they went on the attack. So when the American militia uh, and the American army found out that the British were coming, uh, they panicked and they ran. Well, they had occupied Niagara Village. So what they did was, in minus 20 degree weather, uh at night they forced everybody out in the streets burned the village down and let all this uh all the canadian civilians or the british uh subject uh freeze to death and after that the british were burning every american settlement on the great lakes screaming remember niagara uh doesn't get thought does that <laughs> yeah well <clears throat> you get back to uh more or less what we started talking about the american election and the state of the United States today, uh, I, I see it as a an empire in very rapid decline uh, all over the world. And I would like to counterpose that with what's happening in the rest of the world that is not under American domination now. I would like to focus plus movement which, as you know, will be meeting next week in Kazan, mm -hmm. where presidents and prime ministers and foreign ministers and economy people, ministers of the economy, will all be gathered. And one of the top agendas is moving away from the American petrodollar. Okay. Okay. Well, you, you and I both know that the BRICS Plus will be meeting next week. Pretty sure it's next week. We're that far in the 17th. 27th, uh, uh, 26th, 27th. So, 26th and 27th. Yeah, at the end of next Kazan, week. Mm -hmm. In Kazan. Mm -hmm. And the presidents, prime ministers, uh, foreign ministers, uh, economy ministers, cultural ministers are all going to be there. And one of the biggest things on that agenda is the de-dollarization of the dollar with another way in international payments for goods mm -hmm. and trades. They've already made great progress. They have their own IMF version of the International Monetary Fund. Yeah, but it's not very uh, uh, capable right now because the people that started well, running it were beholden to the IMF. Acceleration of the process mm -hmm. structures, the infrastructure, but before that happens, they're already working out ways to exchange in their own currencies. Yes. 
Russia has been doing this with China and several other countries. Uh, and this is something that has got to be terrifying the imperialist, the capitalist in the US, UK empire. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this, this offers tremendous hope, I hope, for the future order of the world, a more just and free world. But here's my concern, Stas. If those imperialists realizing their days are numbered and that the BRICS movement is going to replace them, I'm concerned of what they might do. And what they might do is the unthinkable. Well, they're not going to commit World War III with nuclear weapons. It could happen, but it's not going to be intentional. For simple fact that they're not going to have anything left. Dead hand will take care of that. Um, it's, you know, what you're calling the imperialists, I, I call the global finance, uh, the global financial elite. And it's there's no point in having your financial elite if you don't have any finance because everything just won't blow it up. Uh, but, but here's my uh, I want to ask you your over under stats if we're going to be a betting man. U.S. and the U.K. There's no way in hell they're going to let bricks go by without trying to disrupt it. And the biggest disruptor we have, which has been biding its time, is. Israel and Iran. I guarantee you, during that BRICS conference, something's going to happen. And the easiest thing to happen to pull attention away from BRICS and everything else is Israel launches a massive uh, missile attack on Iran. Iran, of course, will respond, and we get things going uh, in that direction. And the whole spotlight goes off of BRICS. Uh, well, I don't know. I would agree with you on your, your terminology. Okay, these international capitalists, the finance people, I, 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 they're the ones that control the empires. Oh, yeah. So it's good to name them, at least in, in terms of their, their titles, their functions. Maybe on some other occasion, we could start naming some real names of human beings that have been behind this. The Vatican. But, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Oh. But I, 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 uh, I do think that if the, the Middle East explodes, uh, I, I don't think it's going to cripple the movement of the BRICS. No, it's not going to cripple it, but it's going to draw attention away from it, uh, world attention. And that's going to be the main thing. They can't mm -hmm. stop it, but they can try to hamper at least keep anybody from noticing it. Yeah. You know, one of the big stories uh, that's not really being reported very much, but here in Crimea, it's a huge story. The uh, the increased and enhanced and improved relations with most of Africa. Oh, yeah. yeah. Crimea uh, has sent representatives there. They've come from Africa here. Uh, they're already talking about trade agreements, cultural agreements, educational agreements. I know the same thing is happening in Russia. Uh, well, wait a minute. Crimea I, is Russia. <laughs> when I, look, I spent a lot of years fighting, okay, to promote that, right? <laughs> but you know what? We are a republic, you know. Well, which, which you're, what, what, uh, not to confuse the uh, viewers, uh, A, Russia is a federation, B, Russian regions, which happens, by the way, in a lot of different countries. Uh, Russian regions will do... Uh, little programs with exchange with different countries of different regions of different countries, big countries. You got a small country. You pretty much only have one region there. But uh, yeah, now they do. That, no, that's a good way to explain it. Uh, but anyway, it's a big story. And I think uh, in terms of this geopolitical chessboard that's emerging, uh, Africa becomes a significant player, don't you think? Oh, Absolutely. I, what people don't realize, by the way, the map you're looking at is not a realistic map. Russia's huge. Russia's the size of Latin America. Russia's not bigger than Africa. Africa's about one and a half times bigger than Russia. Uh, and, and Australia is about the size of, uh, of the United States. Uh, people don't realize the map, you're, and it forms your concept. Europe, non-Russian Europe, everything west of Russia, 
that's that's still that's still Europe is actually pretty small. Um, if you look at, at the globe, that gives you a better, I mean, an actual globe, that gives you a better understanding. Africa is gigantic. It's the biggest, after Asia, in particular, if you consider Eurasia, it is the second largest continent. But Africa realistically is gigantic. And people really don't freaking realize how big those countries are. So anyway, my final thoughts. Uh, number one, thanks for having me again on the show. It's always fun to be with you. Uh, but my final thoughts are, uh, I really think, and I don't know whether it ha will happen, I hope it doesn't, but in terms of the final countdown, given what's happening with the increased provocations by the United States and NATO on Russia in Ukraine, with what is unfolding now in the Middle East, uh, not only are we living in very dangerous times, I think we are down to the final countdown. That's how dangerous I think it is. You know, I think everything's doing uh, worse for some and better for others. I don't think the U.S. is going to go for a nuclear war. But what the U.S. is going to do, and it, it looks like it, is if you, if you, everything I've heard and I've talked to people and other people have said, Washington's moved on already past Ukraine. They'll finance, throw, throw some money in it. They're not going to do anything else. But they've psychologically and emotionally, basically the same thing in this case, offloaded on the Europeans. And the Europeans have worked themselves up to a real fine uh, bout of you know, foaming at the mouth uh, uh, idi idi idiocracy. Uh, and they really are now wanting to go to war. A lot of them, a lot of them started believing their own propaganda, which is pretty dangerous. Um, so I think a, a lot of Europe has a pretty good chance of fumbling its way into a big war with Russia. And America is going to be real fine to sit back and sell weapons and things and give credit. Sure, we'll do the finance and let the Europeans die uh, by, by suicide by Russian tank. Uh, and, and just for my viewers, by the way, I guess, oh, why is Russia taking so long to go across uh, Europe? First of all, we're fighting ourselves. As hard as we fight, we're fighting the same people as Ukraine are Russians. Second of all, when this war started, Ukraine had half a million troops, 12,000 tanks. I'm sorry, 1,200 tanks. Your average European superpower like France or Germany or England has 200 to 150 tanks. Ukraine could have conquered all of Europe, except for us, of course. Ukraine could have easily conquered all of Europe, including beating the, the, the Poles' teeth in. Uh, we've destroyed two Ukrainian armies. We're destroying the third one right now. We've destroyed somewhere around mm, well over 2,000 tanks plus, uh, considering everything that was given. And, and amount of equipment. So, yeah, you know, if Europe goes in for the big fight, it's going to be ugly, mostly for the Europeans. Yeah. If they're that stupid. But the Hungarians aren't. And, and I'll have a question for you for, uh, on that line of thought, by the way. I know you've been paying attention. The Hungarians aren't, the Slovakians aren't, the Croatians all of a sudden uh, got their heads out of their asses with a new president. Because the previous president, I don't remember her name, uh, the, the woman... Uh, she, she did some photo modeling in, in a bathing suit. That, uh, um, she said, no way. And now this guy is saying, no way. We're not sending anything. We're not going to fight Russia. Uh, and of course, the Serbs aren't in it. But everybody else seems to be uh, really gung-ho for it, to one degree or another. But uh, in the Euro Parliament, if you were paying attention, uh, Orban was doing a speech. And he flat out, flat out, looking at van der Leyen, van der Leyen, Looking at her, sitting across from him, said, you're trying to overthrow our government. You're tyrannical and you're trying to overthrow our government. What do you think of that? Uh, I've been following Viktor Orban for some time now. Uh, I, He's an incredible leader. Uh, he's not alone. Robert Fischel, or Fijo, yeah. however they pronounce it, is another Fico, one. I think. I, I can't ever pronounce his name right. Well, somebody corrected me from that part of the country. It's uh, it's not like <laughs> Italian Fico or, but but anyway, he's it's another some... one. Uh, he's another one uh, who has come out strongly, and I think even Vucic. I think he's riding the fence right now. He's for you. But you know what? The the big one. The big one is Turkey, Erdogan. Oh yeah, yeah. 
oh my God, what did he do when he announced that he's interested in joining BRICS? <laughs> he's so pissed off that the EU have not let him in, although he's a member of NATO. He wanted membership in the EU. And here he is now, I think, sticking it to him. So <laughs> I think I think the people we've just mentioned, uh, including Erdogan, are posing a huge problem for the EU, for NATO, and the United States. I'm wondering if the United States is going to punish Erdogan in some way. Well, they'll try to revolution. They'll try to overthrow him again. That that's a guarantee. Uh, Turkey is the second most powerful uh, military in uh, NATO. Uh, Turkey will not leave NATO. As a lot of people are saying, and there's a very real practical reason for this. Um, Greece. As long as Turkey is in NATO and Greece is in NATO, NATO can't really take a side between those two guys that really, really hate each other. Uh, there's the issue of uh, Cyprus uh, and North Cyprus. There's the issue of the various islands. Uh, there's the issue of the borders around Thrace. Um, now, if Turkey leaves, then all of the NATO now supports Greece. Not good for Turkey. <laughs> so, no way the Turks... Yeah, they could get kicked out, I guess, but uh, there's no way Turkey is going to leave NATO. It can't. Yeah. It, now, Article 5, if nobody's ever bothered reading that, Article 5 does not say you have to go fight. You have to provide support. What support is, is what every nation gets to decide for itself. Somebody will send a tank division. Somebody will uh, send a couple hundred helmets. Somebody will put a candle and say a prayer. <laughs> you know, that's... Well, that's that's new to me. I didn't realize that. I, I thought Article 5 meant, boom, full-out war. Now, go read Article 4. Article 4, by the way, allows for offensive war uh, as part of NATO. Except it's not all of NATO. You can form certain unions of the willing. This is what Petraeus and all of them are talking about, making yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the coalition, coalition of the willing. Of the willing. And, and, and do some kind of expeditionary uh, you know, adventure across the border of somebody else's uh, land but from the defensive uh, NATO alliance. But yeah, there's also, read Article 4, read Article 5. It's uh, very eye-opening. Uh, so, listen, I want to end on this. Uh, Dr. Helen Caldicott was known really throughout the world and across the United States for being the uh, leading antagonist for nuclear power and nuclear war. Uh, she was in my film, 30 Seconds to Midnight. Her role was really significant. But at the end of the film, given what we talked about in the film, which was the danger of nuclear war, the danger of nuclear power as we have it now, uh, and climate change, she wondered, are we an evolutionary aberration Designed in an evolutionary sense not to survive? No, no, I disagree with that. Oh, well, I think it it looks like we're committing suicide right now. Well, well, first of all, climate change has always been changing. Second of all, there's been a new graph that came out uh, from uh, actual climologists for the last 48 million years. <clears throat> and the interesting part about that graph is we've just barely bounced off the lowest average temperature point over 48 million years if we got any colder particularly the last ice age we would have died out quick question for and, and most people have no idea about this uh, i did see this in a uh, cross-examination uh, of the uh secretary of the environment uh, by one member of the u.s congress so can't remember uh, i don't remember who it was but my hat's off to the guy what percentage because you know co2 is the evil gas never mind it feeds plants but it's the evil gas. Okay, what is the percentage of CO2 in the atmosphere? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. 0.3%. It's one-third of 1% 1 of the atmosphere. During the Ice Age, the last Ice Age, we got almost to 0.2. That's planetary death. Because there's not enough left to feed the plants to make the oxygen to feed us. That's where the planet goes off the deep end and you get the opposite of the, a runaway effect into death and back into uh, molds and, and sponges and things like that, maybe eventually coming back up. 
we're bare, we're not even at 0 0.4, which is, by the way, been the average 0 0.4, 0 0.5 has been the actual average planetary. That's what you get from the sediment and from the ice. You do ice core sampling, you go down there and you check and see what 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 the, the mix up in the oxygen or the atmosphere was in the bubbles in the ice. And so you can tell what it was. We're actually at a very low point. And the interesting thing is, is the higher the level in this case uh, of uh, CO2, the greener the planet becomes. And there was a there were several articles that came out. They were pretty much banned across most of the media. Uh, they came out uh, about three years ago. And a couple of scientists, uh, they've set up some programs that can actually track every tree across the Sahara by satellite photos. By the way, there's over a billion trees in the Sahara. Go figure that one. Uh, you wouldn't think that. Africa's huge. But they track the amount of greenery that's been growing in Africa because the Sahara is retreating. The planet's becoming wetter. The Sahara is in full retreat. And over 20 years, the amount of land that went from being desert, and it didn't go to savanna, it went straight to jungle and forest. The amount of land over 20 years that went straight to jungle and forest is the size of two Francis. This giant green belt is moving north, and the Sahara is in full retreat. And the Sahara in the 1800s swallowed several countries fully, but just depopulated the areas. So I'm, I don't buy into uh, we're all going to die. Now, if we should launch, well, launch nuclear weapons, we're all going to die. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, when I say climate change, probably what I should have said, because climate change has been so politicized, environmental degradation. Ah, that's a different thing. That's a whole different thing. At the hands of humans. But, you know, uh, there's another interesting point uh, by, by that point. Yes, it's true. Uh, but the, low, the more you deindustrialize a nation, uh, the faster you, because the population becomes poor, the faster you go into environmental detriment, uh, de degradation. Because poor people aren't going to take care of parks and the environment. They're going to try to survive. And that means cutting down the parks and environment. They'll cut them down to feed themselves and to keep themselves warm. And because there's so many small farms have gone out of business in, in a lot of countries and went into bigger farms or into because of technology, there's a lot more forest land in the U.S. and in other countries than there have been in hundreds of years. Yeah. Interesting. Well, one of the things that's happening to those forests across the United States West are these annual massive forest fires. Yes. Uh, you know, one could argue that they're necessary because, you know, that gets rid of the old down timber and rotten stuff and then it regrows. But, uh, you know, it's really been wrecking havoc on, and it's not only in the United States, really, it's in many other parts of the country. Very true. Anyway. Uh, by by, by the way, by that point. To, how close we are we to solving all the world's problems? <laughs> It, it, there was a video of Michael Moore. I don't watch Michael Moore no, most of the time. He's, he, I just find him extremely annoying. I'm, I'm not left-wing uh, like he is. But he did do a very interesting uh, documentary. If you cut out his, oh, we should all be living like caveman and, and save the environment crap that he put, puts in there. But he did a very interesting documentary called uh, Planet of the Humans. And it shows that the green energy is all... Pardon my French, bullshit. It is rackets that get cutbacks for friends of the government and nuclear power and things like that are really the way to go because you can't get cheaper, cleaner energy. And the amount of nuclear fuel uh, that uh, contaminant is really not that big. But in the U.S., they have what are called uh, biochemical uh, generators. Translation, they're burning wood, right? Waste wood. But the problem is there really isn't that much waste wood. So what they're now doing is clear-cutting whole forests up in the northeast, clear-cutting mountains to burn it to make electricity, as opposed to, I don't know, burning coal, which gives you like 10, 15 times more electricity than raw wood. But it's all part of the green uh, program, and they're killing forests. That they are doing. Watch the video. It's, it's a very interesting documentary. Yeah, no, I will. I will. Very eye-opening. Uh, extremely eye-opening. Uh and, and by the way, the, the the liberal movement, the U.S. just castrated him after that. <laughs> he became enemy number one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, he had already he had already been 
public enemy number one a long time ago. I mean, well, way for back Republicans. In, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll let you go. <laughs> well, listen, thanks again for having me. I want Thank to wish you, you a, lot of, a lot of luck with your show. Uh, you know, I don't get a chance to watch everything, but I see all of your posts. And when I do have time, I'll click and I'll watch a little bit of it. And you're doing a good job. Really Thank good you. job. And I'm waiting to get back on your show because uh, you, you've been I'm off gonna for try a while. this. I'm going to try this weekend to get back to get back in the saddle with a little trick that I learned from tonight. <laughs> Glad to help. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> you know we'll see you in moscow we'll see you absolutely in moscow. absolutely yeah, absolutely we'll go have a beer and uh and talk it up and maybe we'll even record something some of, off the bar <laughs> I, I want i want some of your pizza ah i closed the pizza place down oh really yeah yeah it was uh it was a uh, money loser it, it, it was it's a long story uh and it was it was uh, a lot to do with uh, the local government uh, because they they backed oh. off their 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 uh, certain projects that were supposed to get people in uh, into that area living and you know. Well, delete Not, this last piece. Delete this last yeah, piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Cheers, man. Thanks for coming. All right. Yeah, we'll see you. Bye. -bye. Yeah.